Okay, well, good morning, everybody. A uh, very warm welcome to this uh, ANL or financial crime training session. Uh, my name is Jeremy Hackett, and uh, for those of you who attended the sessions last year with uh, with IFAC, there'll probably be a familiar face popping back up onto uh, onto your screen today. Um, I would just like to draw your attention to the fact that uh, this session is actually being recorded. So um, that's so that um, Charlie and the guys at IFAC can have it uh, available to you for reference purposes and for people who are able to attend this session here this morning. Uh, the session is scheduled to, uh, to last about 90 minutes. Uh, if, we can, uh, if we can complete any faster, then we will. We won't draw it out because I know many of you will want to crack on and as soon as possible after the training for those of you who need to actually go on to the BAT system and uh, and do the, the exam around AML, but more of that later. Um, just a little bit about myself. Uh, as, as I've said, my name is Jeremy Hackett. Um, I've been in training and development for 30, 40 years. Um, started off with Allied Dunbar, uh, then worked for uh, AXA, Prudential, and then latterly the Nationwide Building Society, where I was head of training there. And for the last six years or so, I've uh, run my own training consultancy business. Aside from IFAC, I work with St James Place Wealth Management. I also work with Schroders, and I work with a company called Redmond Advance. That's my kind of core portfolio of clients. And in addition to that, I also do lots of point to one work with uh, with Tide and IFA advisors. <laughs> okay, so can I ask, uh, unless unless you are uh, asking a question, could I ask you to go on mute so that you don't uh, uh, drown me out for people who uh, who wanted to to listen. So without any uh, any more ado, uh, let's let's get on the way. If you have any questions as I'm going through, please feel free to uh, to chip in or put your hand up and we'll do our best to, uh, to help you as we go along. So, <clears throat> what are we going to be doing together this morning? Well, by the end of the session, you'll be very well prepared, as I've said, to be successful in the exam that many of you need to take. <clears throat> So what are we going to be looking at? We're going to be looking at the relevant regulations that, um, that surround, just letting some people in, excuse me, money laundering. We're also going to be looking at the need to conduct uh, customer due diligence. And that's something I think is so well baked into uh, to processes these days. You'll kind of be all over that. <clears throat> excuse me. We'll also be looking at how not only to identify but report suspicious activity. And I'm very cognizant that for many of you that will simply be a refresher because your systems and processes are well defined. Well, then again, remind ourselves who are potentially exposed uh, people, um, not something we come across typically in our day to day um, business, but we need to know who they are just in case. We'll also look at uh, what is meant, both in the uh, legislative terms and practical terms, uh, around terrorist financing. Because these days, you know, when we talk about money laundering in the same sentence, we also need to think through the implications of terrorist financing. Uh, and you'll see as we move into the legislation that these things have actually become kind of intertwined and go hand in glove these days. And then towards the end of the session, we'll be looking at financial crime, the uh, potential um, bear traps you can fall into when you're in a business, how to mitigate risks. Uh, excuse me, just letting some more latecomers in. They all seem to be in now. Good. <clears throat> so let's uh, let's move on then. Let's start off again, just reminding ourselves what we mean when we talk about money laundering. So money laundering every time <clears throat> occurs, every time a transaction takes place or a relationship is formed that involves crime or any form of property. Now let's just define what we actually mean by property here. 
quite simply, property is assets of every kind. So typically when we think about money laundering, we probably think about big wads of cash. You know, for those of you who, like me, uh, watch some of the American dramas on Netflix, you know, Ozark, Breaking Bad, that kind of thing. We associate that with drug money and a lot of wads of cash. But actually, the definition is, uh, is much broader than that. It involves any assets, actually, that, um, that you hold, even if uh, it's just the, the, the legal papers that give you entitlement to assets. So the, uh, the good example of that would be maybe some deeds to a property or some bearer bonds for, uh, for investments. So quite a broad definition in terms of property when we're talking about money laundering. In addition to that, it also includes any money or assets that have actually been exchanged. So initially they were obtained through some sort of criminal activity. They've been washed and they're now clean. Um, and there's no obvious link. But as you'll see when we look at the legislation, you know, there's quite swinging and wide powers to, uh, to make financial orders against uh, criminals who have successfully washed the money and they can seize all their assets. And from time to time, we see this in the newspapers on all other media channels, don't we, where somebody's had all their assets kind of seized, whether that be the, uh, the home, the cars, the yacht, whatever it is that uh, has, has been purchased with those ill-gotten gains of crime. So that's what money laundering is. Uh, and why do people, why do criminals want to launder money? Well, quite simply, as we've already alluded to, it's to move assets that were obtained illegally through illicit criminal or terrorist, terrorist activities and get that into the legitimate financial system. I mean, the reason for that is quite simple, because unless you do that, you aren't able as a criminal to fully utilise the assets in the, uh, the legitimate economy. And I guess if that's what uh, your day job is, that's what you want, actually want to do. You want to uh, benefit from the fruits of your criminal activity. So you need to, um, until you can do that, you can't fully benefit. There's only so much you can do with a, a wad of cash. You need to turn that into other assets to enable you to, uh, to participate fully in the legitimate economy. And it's, uh, it's big, a big business money laundering. It's, it's typically a, a global, issue excuse me just letting a few late comers in here there we go <clears throat> so in terms of money laundering regulations um well we can go right back into the uh, the 1990s when that was the first um time point really where some um checks and balances were put in place to try and uh, stamp out and combat and mitigate uh, anti-money laundering. Uh, and there's been a whole raft of leg legislation ever since. I think we're all familiar with the, uh, the proceeds of Crime Act, the good old POCA 2002. That introduced things such as uh, assisting and tipping off and all those good things that we're going to, uh, to look at later on during this training session. Another important piece of uh, uh, regulations that you need to be aware of is the Money Laundering Regulations 2007. Uh, you never know when that kind of information might be useful later. Um, and that just built on, um, in, for the more specific lens, um, requirements for firms and individuals around money laundering. And as you can see, uh, as I said in, in my opening remarks, money laundering is now kind of broadened out. So when we talk about money laundering and anti-money laundering measures, we should also be thinking to ourselves about terrorist financing. So you can see there are two pieces of legislation there that actually for the first time started to include requirements around terrorist financing. Uh, and they've been in force uh, the most uh, recent act since January 2020. More of that later on in the session. <clears throat> As I said earlier, the... Uh, the money laundering is, is a global issue, it's a global problem, and there is a global entity that concerns itself with trying to eradicate money laundering. So the international regulator is somebody called the Financial Action Task Force, 
Um, something you may not have remembered uh, and, and from your R01 days, actually, when you were doing your level four diploma. So that's what, where, where most of us come across that for the first time. Basically, that's uh, central banks, uh, representatives of governments who sit kind of at that high level and try and work out how to cooperate with one another in order to try and stamp out uh, money laundering. Because the one thing we know about money laundering these days and the advent of, uh, of IT and technology, it's possible to uh, kind of wash funds electronically overshore, uh, oh, sorry, overseas, offshore. Um, so most of the developed uh, nations are kind of working collectively to try and make sure that doesn't happen. Although we all know there are still a number of safe havens where um, we've got a bit of a reputation for not being too bothered about the checks that they apply when you're trying to uh, invest your money offshore. Dropping down into, uh, into the UK, then the FCA is the main financial services regulator who concern themselves with, uh, with money laundering. And you'll see that through their, uh, their, their rule books and all the requirements that we're required to do in the advisory space. <clears throat> the HMRC shares responsibility of investigating events with the FCA. In terms of enforcement, uh, that power is shared by the Serious Fraud Office, but also the National Crime Agency. And it's really the NCA who take the lead on this. And as you'll see later on in the training session, they're our first port of call, or certainly the first port of call for the money laundering officer, if there's any uh, suspicion that uh, money laundering activities might be, uh, might be afoot. So everyone in financial services is required by law to combat money laundering and the financing of terrorism. Not telling you anything you don't know uh, already. And as I say, most of us who work in the advisory space in financial services have got very well defined systems and processes in place around identification checks and establishing source of funds as the first line of defense against money laundering. Now, in terms of your obligations, you'll probably be pretty uh, relieved to know that you don't need to memorise the uh, AML legislation. However, you are expected to understand it. Uh, and that's what these, I guess, annual compliance refreshers are all about. Just bringing things to, uh, to the front of your mind, just refreshing your memory in terms of what your obligations are. And you never know, it might just prompt you to take a... Uh, another look at the systems and processes that you have in your business as part of your annual review of the AML process. <clears throat> so you do need to know what money laundering is and you do need to know what terrorist financing is. And the good news is that by the end of this training session, you will absolutely know what they are. <clears throat> You'll also need to know how these particular offences could potentially affect you. So again, uh, just um, share with you some of the potential uh, pitfalls we could fall into and what the potential consequences of that are. <clears throat> you know that you're legally obliged to verify identity and source of funds and all that kind of good stuff. Um, and again, you'll have well-documented processes, no doubt, about recognising suspicious activity and a formal process within your firm and then beyond about how you make a report. So in terms of your kind of obligations, what you need to know, uh, that's, that's what you need to understand. And that's really what the, uh, the exam on anti-money laundering will, will test your understanding of. <clears throat> so what do the regulations require of firms? I, I've talked about this a lot, but it's about really having checks and balances, systems, processes and controls in place that really just help mitigate risk. Because, you know, criminals are becoming increasingly sophisticated. They're looking for ways to kind of get their money into the legitimate uh, system. Um, just by the very dint, the nature of the, uh, the profession that we're in and the business we transact. If you think about things like, uh, you know, investments, uh, for some that could be seen as an attractive route to try and uh, put their money into the system and to try and uh, lay 
lay some confusion between the source and origin and where that the source of those funds uh, eventually kind of pop out. <clears throat> so the FCA will expect, uh, as you know, for you to have documented processes in place um, that you can evidence that no processes in place and in your day-to-day -day business, everybody's adhering to them. And I'm sure of you, a lot of you on the call use the, uh, the good offices of, uh, of IFAC in terms of an external audit of your business to make sure everything's as it needs to be and you're safe and sound from a business perspective. <clears throat> it also introduced uh, client ID and verification checks and uh, stipulates that um, you know, you have to keep the records for a minimum of five years after the end of a, a relationship. I think that's something we all kind of know. <clears throat> Overall responsibility for money laundering needs to rest with a director or senior manager within the business. Um, that's uh, an indication, I guess, of how seriously the, uh, the regulatory bodies, including the FCA, take our money laundering responsibilities. And we are required, as you know, to have a money laundering reporting officer in place, the good old SMF 17, who acts as a conduit, very much as a focus for day-to-day -day activity and uh, audit systems and is almost like a, uh, a radar looking for potential problems that, uh, that may be coming up. Okay, select session, there we go. <clears throat> And as I said earlier, at least uh, once a year, uh, you need to report on the, uh, the operational effectiveness, basically, of your AML controls. And typically that's done by the uh, money laundering reporting officer. So part of their, uh, part of their remit. <clears throat> the other thing is to make sure that everybody is kind of cognizant of their role and responsibilities uh, and staff training. So, you know, for those of you who are on the call today, congratulations. You know, this is you kind of getting your annual MOT, your uh, compliance refresh, if you like, evidencing to the regulator that you're fit and proper. Not only have you got the right qualifications to do the role, but you're understanding the additional responsibilities that go with your advisory administrative role within the particular business that you work. As you know, if uh, if you are a money laundering reporting officer, then you before you can even step into the role and start to do it, then you have to be authorised by the FCA. Again, under the senior manager's regime, just another kind of indication about how seriously uh, all authorities view money laundering and having appropriate checks and balances in place to try and stamp it out. So I'm just going to take a, uh, a quick look at the role of a money laundering reporting officer. Um, some of you on the call may be in this role already or may be moving into this particular role. So as I've already said, there has to be an MRO in place who has oversight for money laundering and acts as a focal point so that everybody in the business knows who to approach if they have any suspicions or any concerns in this area. And you know it does it does uh, carry a significant amount of responsibility this this role because ultimately if it's taken to its uh, conclusion and um, and people have been intercepted trying to undertake um, money laundering activities then that will go to either civil civil or criminal action and you know there are some uh, th there's lots of examples I don't know if you saw in the uh, media just a few weeks ago, actually, that uh, HSBC were fined through criminal action for uh, not having appropriate checks and balances in place. Uh, and they uh, took a 547 million pound fine for their, for their trouble. I don't know quite what their shareholders think of that, but um, you know, these things unfortunately are still uh, not being uh, fully mitigated even in some of the biggest household names we can think of in the UK. So the role of the, uh, the MLRO is very clearly defined in the FCA handbook. And don't worry, I'm not going to suddenly produce a copy of the FCA handbook. Um, but basically, if you distill down what it's saying in that handbook, it's saying that understandably, 
they're there to ensure that everybody within the business is complying with the firm's controls, checks and balances they have in place. As I said, it's part of the senior managers regime and the FCA are very specific here that they expect this role to carry sufficient seniority, uh, authority and independence so that whenever required, they have uh, access to sufficient resources, sufficient information to carry out their responsibilities. Now that doesn't mean cash, it could do, but it could also mean you know, um, human resources, uh, time resources, um, MI and data provision resources to make sure that everything is as it should be. They deal with any information, knowledge or suspicion of money laundering. We'll move on later in the session to see uh, how that actually happens. But as I said, right at the start of the training session, these are the kind of the, the go-tos, if you like, the, uh, the gateway, uh, because they need to disclose matters to the uh, National Crime Agency. So as I said, very much the NCA take the lead on uh, money laundering and AML initiatives in the, in the UK, particularly from an enforcement point of view. So any money laundering officer who has any uh, inkling of suspicion, they disclose the matters to the NCA. In terms of, uh, of other controls, um, proof of ID and address, uh, that has to be done just as soon as you can after the first contact. If you're working uh, outside of uh, an individual, you might be working like trusts, you might be working with businesses, checking the identity of beneficial owners to make sure everything as it should be there. <clears throat> Trans trans uh, transactions will not go on risk until these risk assessments are completed. And you are uh, expected to have uh, suspicious activity reporting process in place that everybody knows and understands and is easily accessible. In terms of uh, record keeping, um, then we need to keep any documents that relate to financial transactions, client identity, <coughs> and your annual review of the money laundering process. So all, I think, straightforward stuff. <coughs> So just a refresher then, I know we've, uh, we've probably all looked at the three stages of money laundering uh, many times before, but just to, uh, just to refresh our memories. <clears throat> These are sequential really. So the first element, the first stage of money laundering is to try and get the cash that's been generated oh. from a criminal activity into the financial system, yeah. So, um, as I say, most people uh, associate um, money laundering with, with drugs money. So to give you an analogy here, um, I don't know if you're like me, on Netflix you've been watching Ozark. It's, uh, it's in its uh, last season now, but it's following the, uh, the story of, uh, of Marty, who works for a Mexican drug cartel and his role is to uh, launder money on behalf of the cartel, cartel. And he's very much fixated initially with getting money into the system. So uh, what he's done is he's bought a casino because casino is very cash rich and it's easy to take some of the ill-gotten gains of... Uh, of uh, can I ask uh, if anybody has... Uh, we can hear some background noise. Could you just recheck and mute if necessary? <laughs> okay, we'll carry on. I can't find who uh, who's playing as that lovely music. Um, 
So it's about getting money into the system, your your dirty money, as it were, trying to find routes to get it into the system. So he's using the casino to bring it down the scale. You could um, take an interest in a business as a director or whatever and try and uh, get it into the system like that. <laughs> the next stage of the process is, uh, is to layer the money. And... Um, the thing about layering money, that's about trying to um, trying to muddy the waters, let's put it like that. Muddy the waters so that it's difficult to find a trail of the original source of, of the funds. So that could be through uh, moving it around between different institutions. And this is where, you know, we we in financial services could, could be vulnerable where people are moving uh, investments between providers to try and obfuscate the uh, origin of money. Um, it's very sophisticated business these days. Um, criminals will try and take money offshore and try and wash it through uh, accounts overseas before they try and remit it back into uh, into the UK. Or they'll make plans to uh, be reunited with their money in some foreign territory that maybe doesn't have an extradition treaty. So layering, placements, getting it into the system in the first place, getting your ill-gotten gains in. Layering is about obstification. Going back to my Ozark example, what Marty's done after having put it into the casino, he's buying legitimate businesses. So he's buying uh, shopping centres, he's buying um, stud farms, and he's trying to then, then he sells them and moves them on into uh, into other assets because <clears throat> as i said right at the uh the, the outset of the workshop really uh, it's all about trying to get your hands on the ill-gotten gains if you're a criminal it's about integrating the money back into the legitimate economy and making it seem as if you've created this uh, this wealth in a legitimate way so you're trying to turn it into assets or uh, property and as we've seen that doesn't have to be physical. It could be just paper-based bonds, uh, deeds, that kind of thing, so that you can now fully enjoy kind of uh, the spoils of your labour. <clears throat> so uh, three stages of money laundering. Don't have me to, uh, to remember these. Remember that they're sequential. You place it, you layer it, you integrate it. In terms of when are we most vulnerable in financial services, well, when I to tell you a, a recent report from the Institute of Financial Accountants, it's their view that FS businesses are most vulnerable at the layering and integration stages, um, which kind of makes sense if you think about it. You know, gone are the days where I think clients come in with big wadges of cash uh, that they wanted to invest with us. <clears throat> Earlier on in the session, I talked about the uh, the POCA, the Proceeds of Crime Act, and that's been with us since uh, 2002. And as I said, that introduced for the first time uh, a number of uh, criminal offences that would result in either imprisonment and or fines if you were found to be involved in them. Again, this is something that uh, I know you've covered before. We're just refreshing your knowledge, but be very uh, useful information to uh, to retain for later. So let's walk through them one by one then. So tipping off. <clears throat> tipping off is where you have uh, either uh, inadvertently or explicitly actually made somebody aware that they may be subject to investigation, which could actually prejudice the investigation. If that were to happen, then um, you could find yourself on the end as an individual of an unlimited fine and some jail time. It, it could be up to five years imprisonment if you're found guilty of, of tipping off. So in terms of examples of that, it could be that the, the police have made contact. It's the first time that you've, you've become aware of this. And um, for whatever reason, you, uh, you, you let your client know that you've been contacted by the police and they're looking into them from a model laundering perspective. That's a, that's a big no-no. The other is if you've had your own suspicions and you've completed through your firm's uh, processes that suspicious activity report, 
Um, and you've said, look, we can't really uh, do that until we can't complete the business until we've had a result from that activity report. Uh, that again is a big no-no. <clears throat> if in doubt, you know, always tip off. Uh, sorry, always disclose, or don't tip off the, the client. So don't let these things that there's um, financial uh, uh, penalties and jail time at the end of this worry you, because if you do your job properly, that will never be an issue, yeah? In addition to, uh, to tipping off, the next one we looked at was assisting. Now, assisting really is the big no-no, because this means that you're sort of complicit because uh, it's been proven that you've concealed, disguised, or really helped in the transference of ill-gotten or illegitimate funds into legitimate property. And because this is regarded as the most serious, because you're culpable in, uh, in actually abetting the criminal, this carries the most kind of jail time. So you can actually incur up to 14 years in jail for this as well as an unlimited fine. In terms of assisting, so <clears throat> you know your clients under investigation, but for whatever reason, you let them make a withdrawal from their investments. One that may not be quite so, uh, so obvious and self-explanatory is if we're working with a self-employed client and you know that within their bank account, there are payments going in there that uh, aren't being declared to the tax man. You check in with the client and they tell you that they weren't aware they had to. Um, and you decide not to take that any further. You just put a note on their file. That again is a big no-no. That's assisting them with uh, defrauding of, uh, of taxation. And don't do it, basically. <clears throat> the other bit is, uh, the other third and final element is failing to report. So, you know, you've got reasonable grounds. You suspect that another person is involved in money laundering, but you don't report it. Again, maximum of five years imprisonment or an unlimited fine. And this is what I was saying earlier, don't let these, um, don't worry too much about these fines. If you're doing your job properly and adhering to the processes, then this will never touch you. you know, if in doubt, report it, talk to the money laundering officer. Um, I've worked in financial services, as I said, for 30 years, only ever done this uh, once um, when I worked for, uh, for the Nationwide. So it's not something that happens day to day, but don't be frightened to do it. <clears throat> but again, uh, failing to report, uh, you think they're uh, not declaring all their income, so you've got to make a suspicious uh, report, a suspicious activity report there. Um, if you don't do that, uh, you've got a problem. Uh, and if you don't make a note on the file, you've got an even bigger problem. So that's failing to report. So I'm, I'm cognizant that uh, all of that is, is just a refresher for you. This is uh, something you're, you're well used to, uh, as indeed will, will this be. This is all around customer due diligence. And for me, this is really where kind of the rubber hits the road uh, in terms of money laundering. And it's so well baked in to our day-to-day -day operational processes now. Sometimes we probably even forget the, the, the origins of this and where it came from. So if we cast our minds back to some of the legislation, you know, the regulations say that we should, as a business, have appropriate due diligence checks in place to specifically mitigate against the risk of money laundering or facilitating the act of money laundering. There are four main stages to CDD, customer due diligence. The first one would be to assess the risks. Now, this is something where you're going to have to use your uh, experience and your judgment in terms of uh, risk assessment. Um, and, you know, 999 times out of a thousand, they'll be, this will just be routine and straightforward and there won't be uh, a requirement to do anything like an enhanced due diligence check. Yeah. <clears throat> The other thing you need to do is to verify the client's identity. You all have your own systems and uh, procedures in place for that. <clears throat> I recently did a uh, transaction 
and you know, was sending uh, copies of the uh, utility bills and driving licenses. Um, my uh, partner sent uh, an employer identity card as well to verify the identity. It's quite wide, wide ranging. More challenging these days in, the, in terms of uh, virtual meetings, and you have to do some additional checks and balances if you're not meeting your clients uh, face to face to confirm their identity, as you know. <clears throat> the other thing you need to do is to uh, demonstrate that you know your client from a due diligence point of view. So, you know, is there anything out of the ordinary which might give rise to suspicion? Is there anything, a bell ringing, a light flashing on your dashboard that says, you know what, this doesn't really ring true for me? Yeah. And I may have to think about doing uh, an enhanced level of due diligence on this particular client. As I say, you won't find this written down. It's very much a, a judgment call. <clears throat> and key to remember that, you know, it's not a one time event in terms of your responsibilities around due diligence. You know, uh, if you've got into a, a new client relationship, you've gone through the uh, customer due diligence and then somewhere down the track, something else happens like uh, you know maybe they've, they've moved or maybe they've uh, they've married or something like that you've got to uh, you've got to be diligent and do your customer due diligence again um and what the fca would expect to see that you know you have got robust systems and processes in place so that you can evidence that you are assessing risk correctly you're taking the right steps around identifying and knowing your clients and that it isn't a one-off event at the start of a relationship that you are ongoing um, monitoring um, your clients from a due diligence point of view <clears throat> if you deem that uh, business is higher risk um, and it could be because they're not physically present uh, present for id purposes then you might want to do enhanced due diligence. Yeah. So enhanced due diligence, as you know, requires you to apply one or more additional checks. And again, you know, don't use one as a baseline. If you think more are required, then crack on and do that. So, you know, <clears throat> get additional identification documents off the client so that you are crystal clear that this individual is who they say they are and they reside where they say they are and they're kind of legitimately in the system. <clears throat> if you are struggling in any way, it's always a good uh, idea to go to other financial institutions who, like you, are subject to money laundering directives in the UK in particular and obtain verification and certification of documentation from them yeah another uh, strategy if you like is to make sure that when the client makes a payment to you that it comes from an account which is in that client's name from a financial institution who are once again are subject to money laundering directives that way you can prove you're being as fastidious and diligent as you need to be to try and um, not expose yourself to the, to the unnecessary risk of being used for money laundering. You also need to have relevant evidence as to how monies for the product were accumulated. So for those of you who uh, work with uh, clients in the mortgage space, this is kind of a uh, meat drink to you, I know. Uh, in terms of looking at where equity from properties is coming and getting clients to actually uh, prove and substantiate that. Also, for those of you who work in the, uh, the lump sum investment space, making sure that you are very comfortable with the source of the funds and how those funds were accumulated and there's nothing untoward in terms of that. <clears throat> You know, and if if in doubt, you know, the uh, the Internet is a very powerful tool these days. It's amazing what you can find on there. Uh, you know, do an, an Internet search, search, search the individuals, search the financial institutions, get that on the file so that you can demonstrate you've done your enhanced customer due diligence. 
It's about being able to evidence everything that, uh, that you've done. <clears throat> Where you perceive the risk of money laundering is very high, then obtain independent intelligence. Yeah, and these cases will be the ones that you probably still remember all those years after. You know, uh, a friend of mine is uh, is an IFA. Uh, they did some business with a client who was uh, relocating, actually moving to the UK from Canada. His parents had originally uh, emigrated to Canada. Parents were now deceased. He decided to come back to, to UK, landed in the UK. He was trying to remit assets, uh, parental assets, his inheritance back to the UK from Canada. So um, my, my friend at the IFA did a very uh, heightened level of due diligence there in terms of even contacting the institution uh, in Canada who were handling the money and making sure everything was, uh, was legitimate and as it should be. <clears throat> so as I say, these cases uh, are kind of enhanced due diligence is probably non-mainstream. It's one that you remember the technological uh, use of post-COVID now, as we as we don't meet clients face-to-face uh, -face so much, has meant there's some additional strands around identity checking. Um, in terms of enhanced due diligence, you always have to do enhanced due, to, due diligence for people who are deemed to be politically exposed. So again, who is a politically exposed person? Well, basically, they're individuals who, in the previous 12 months, have had a very high profile. Typically, it's a politically high profile or been running a public function. And it also includes not just the individual, but close uh, associates and immediate family members of these pets. Now, the reason for this is that obviously, if they are in a high profile position, they could have an undue level of influence uh, and they could themselves or one of their family members could be corrupt and they could be unduly using their influence to actually get things done from a criminal perspective. Or it could be they, they themselves are being blackmailed and they are under considerable pressure from a uh, criminal fraternity, maybe themselves or their family members are being uh, blackmailed into doing something they wouldn't want to do. So because they're in these high roles, uh, it's always, always a requirement to do enhanced due diligence. So the sorts of um, people who would fall into this category, as I've said, heads of state, government ministers, political members of governing bodies of political parties, yeah, judges, ambassadors, you get the kind of, um, get the, the gist here. These aren't your kind of normal day-to-day -day kind of roles that the vast majority, this is probably looking at your top 1% in terms, not necessarily of wealth, that's not what this is all about. This is about uh, positions of power, I guess, and influence rather than wealth per se. <clears throat> So we've, um, we've looked at money laundering. We've said that uh, money laundering has uh, came about as early as the 90s. We've said there's been a whole raft of legislation that's kind of built on money laundering and that money laundering is now kind of broadened out. So when we think about money laundering, we should also think about terrorist financing as well. And that's been kind of put into our processes and systems through various acts of parliament and also through the FCA rule book. <clears throat> what we've said is that you don't have to necessarily be fully cognizant of the acts of parliament. You though do, uh, you do though have to be cognizant of your roles and responsibilities uh, in terms of money laundering, both as you as an individual and at firm level. So you have to have the relevant systems and processes in place to uh, mitigate risks of money laundering. We said that in terms of money laundering, there are three elements to it. The initial element is placement, where you're trying to get your money into the system in the first place. 
So typically you have to hook up with some sort of legitimate business and filter, wash the money in with legitimate funds, wash the dirty money in. Then it's all about the second element about layering, where we try and obstificate, we muddy the waters, we try and make it very difficult to get the original source of funds from where those funds ultimately will end up. Uh, and that could involve uh, us in the financial services industry, particularly through property transactions and or investment transactions. And then there's the final part where uh, you know, it's integrated back into the system where the criminal fraternity can actually enjoy the full spoils because it's legitimate funds now back into the legitimate economy. <clears throat> we said that from a money laundering perspective, then um, you know it uh, does carry the potential of unlimited fines and also jail time. And we looked at uh, tipping off, assisting, and failing to disclose as the three core elements. And uh, we've said that the uh, the most serious one is assisting because you're culpable with actually helping them to uh, helping the criminal. Uh, in terms of getting their hands on money. <clears throat> we then looked at things like uh, customer due diligence, uh, and we said that, you know, this is very much down to you, using your professionalism, using your experience, using your judgment, to say, okay, what's the risk here? Is this just a straightforward transaction? Does everything look like it, it should be? Or do I need to do some enhanced due diligence? Do I know my client? Can I prove that I know my client? Um, do I have, have I followed all the checks and balances that I need to follow? Can I evidence that? Can I demonstrate that? You know, <clears throat> have I checked their ID? Have I checked their address? Have I done that as soon as possible after the, the first meeting? You know, I've used my experience. We used to have this uh, this this saying when I was in training at uh, at Allied Dunbar all those years ago. You know, if it's yellow, has an orange beak and quacks, then it's a duck. Um, so that's uh, another way of describing your intuition. So very much when you're looking at the money laundering, use your intuition. If it doesn't feel right, if it doesn't look right then it probably isn't right. And you should never be afraid to make a report to the money laundering reporting officer. There's no downside in making a report and that being investigated, even if your suspicions were unfounded. The downside is if you don't, yeah. <clears throat> and for certain activities, then enhanced due diligence will definitely be required. So further checks and balances, uh, you know, at least one additional check, but as many as you've deemed, to be necessary. And we we kind of closed out by looking at politically exposed people to say that you know, these come with their own uh, level of, uh, of enhanced risk. So they're always subject to enhanced uh, customer due diligence. Uh, but these are roles not necessarily related to wealth. So it wouldn't necessarily be like the likes of Richard Branson's or Jeff Bezos. It's people who are high up in government or the judiciary or running companies that could find themselves in a position of undue influence or subject to um, being influenced by threats made against their person and or their immediate family. So that's kind of a, a recap if you like, of, uh, of where we've got to. I'm just going to pause now before I move on. If anybody's got any questions on that, I'll pause and take any questions. Okay, I assume silence means uh, just crack on with it, Jeremy. So the next, uh, the next element I'm going to look at is suspicious activity. So this is these are the things that may alert us to the fact that we've either got to do some enhanced due diligence here or we've got to uh, make some sort of report. It's broken down into uh, to four areas. We're going to walk through each and unpack them uh, individually. So people, transactions, arrangements and assets. <clears throat> Let's start by looking at people. So you probably know this better than I do. For those of you who uh, you're probably new to, to role. 
Um, this might be quite timely. So suspicious people is where, you know, they give you, give you some ID and you're saying, I'm not actually sure what your ID here, or it's not legal. Uh, and again, it is, uh, although they're working very hard, all the authorities to try and prevent uh, ID fraud and ID theft, it's still very much alive and well. And uh, people are using fraudulent identities today as we speak. It's quite a sophisticated kind of business. So you have to have your kind of, um, you have to be very uh, diligent in terms of looking at ID and making sure it's, it's, it's as you think it should be and it is legal. <clears throat> this is what I was saying about trusting yourself, backing yourself, using your professionalism, your judgment, your experience, your intuition, if necessary, to say, hmm, you know what, when asking you questions, trying to get to know you as a client, you've been a little bit evasive there, yeah, and that is unusual, so, you know, little bells ringing. You're trying to get me to crack on and, and, and hurry up when processing the transaction, you know, they say things like, well, you know, is it possible not to go through the cooling off period, da, 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 da. Just want to get on because, you know, they just want to get their money moving into the system. So again, it doesn't feel right. They're not providing you with consistent information. So, you know, it's shifting sand from that point of view and they're saying things or providing documents that are con contradicting things they've said or provided you with earlier. It could be that, you know, they don't even want to talk about your fees or charges or whether they could get a better deal elsewhere. They are just totally oblivious to it. Now, this again, this is where our judgment and common sense comes in because some clients aren't. They're quite happy to pay a fee for your financial acumen and professional expertise and they are genuinely concerned about it so this is about pieces in a jigsaw really putting them putting them all together uh, so everything everything there i'll just sum it up as common sense when you're dealing with people just apply common sense do they look sound and provide evidence of being who they say they are <clears throat> Looking at a transactional point of view, you may have suspicions about money that's being moved from one party to, to another. So it could be something like unexpected buying or selling patterns. You know, irrespective of market conditions, you can just see that you know, they're buying and selling and buying and selling at, at points in time that are either too frequent or take no account whatsoever of market conditions. Could also be that somehow they've been able to fund mortgage payments that doesn't match their circumstances. So you're looking at them earning, you know, uh, 50 grand a year in a white collar job, and yet they've got a mortgage for a million quid on a, on a property value that three and a half million, you know, how's, how's that work? It could be that there is atypical kind of profile so it, the, the, the sources of the money is coming from several different accounts uh, or a different account to the one that they've kind of declared up front with you <clears throat> again it could be that their bank statements or their mortgage statements are showing lots of movement of money going in and out you know one good way to uh, to loan the money is to take out a big mortgage and then as quickly as you can get that mortgage paid down yeah and then it it gives you the the property as an asset as a whole that you can move on if you get away with it could also be that there's some some uh, funds coming from overseas that uh, the client hasn't declared any uh, connection with whatsoever um, so that might again ring a bell and it could be that the the sums being moved around or in and out of accounts look like they're more than would typically be needed for you know, their lifestyle or the business that's actually being conducted. <clears throat> in terms of 
the third element, arrangements. This is where uh, the layering uh, point comes in, because what they're trying to do is they're trying to muddy the waters. So, you know, a client lives in the north, you've got your business down in the south, they just contact you out of the blue saying, I found you on the, on the internet, I want to do business uh, with you. Well, you know, however great your business is, with, uh, with respect, you know, there's, uh, there's probably be uh, thousands of other advisors somewhere between the north and the south where you're based that they could choose to do business with. So why are they coming to you? What is it about you? That means they want to train and do business with you. <clears throat> Compared to what you've done in terms of know your clients as part of your uh, due diligence, uh, there seems to be activities that are either unusual, you wouldn't be expecting to see them there, or irregular. Again, disguising who's really in control using private companies, trusts, and charities. So, again, think about what the uh, criminal is trying to do. They're trying to muddy the waters. So making it difficult for you to track down the source of the funds because it's coming from a closed private company or it's coming from an obscure trust or a, or a charity. <clears throat> They're using offshore entities to, uh, to purchase property or, or to hold accounts. And again, using your judgment to say, you know, in, in all the cases that I've, I've been involved in, these arrangements seem much more complicated than they actually need to be. Why the hell are they so complicated than, you know, the need to do the business that we're talking about? Just doesn't tie up, doesn't make sense. <clears throat> and it's, uh, it's where they're trying to not give you uh, the full picture. So they're trying to uh, get around, giving you information, leaving things blank, trying to circumvent the, uh, the standard procedures. The final element in terms of sus uh, suspicious activity is assets. So again, more difficult when you're working on Zoom, but it could be things like they've got things that um, you wouldn't necessarily expect them to have given their declared income and, and their declared occupation and what you would equate that with looking like in terms of lifestyle, you know. So why have we got a Rolls Royce Phantom? You know, why are they living in a house worth five million quid? Why have they got the Rolex? Where's all these expensive possessions coming from? It's dis disproportionate to their income and their background. The control of the funds, the assets, can't be explained by their business interests, their occupation, or their family. So they're almost being used as a, as a front, as a Trojan horse, really, to try and get assets into the system. Or they've got assets that really just don't tie up in terms of what they do in the general course of, uh, of their business. So they've got assets in their business, which serve no purpose, their normal trading activities. So they own a massive warehouse on an industrial estate, but um, they've got no use for a warehouse in terms of uh, the, uh, the profession they're choosing to, to trade in. They hold assets in someone else's name when it's clear that they are in control and enjoy the benefit, yeah? So I'm not talking about something like a, an enduring power of attorney here. I'm talking about, you know, this uh, property in somebody else's name, but you're living in it. It looks like it's rent free and da 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 Or um, you're getting proceeds from a trust. Now, all of these could be legitimate. It's a case of doing your enhanced due diligence and checking, checking that out. <clears throat> They're also kind of over eager if you like, over willing to commit and make investments that cannot be justified by a potential profitability, whether that be in an asset backed investment or whether that be in something like property or other assets, they're willing just to take uh, just almost looks like they're just trying to get money into the system, regardless of what the return is going to be on that. <clears throat> 
So in terms of arrangements, uh, that's that. Where anything is, uh, is untoward and you cannot uh, satisfy yourself, um, even uh, if you've done your enhanced due diligence, then what you need to do, what you must do as required by legislation is to make a suspicious activity report. Yeah. Uh, and that is very formalized now as a result of legislation into the way suspicious activity reports have to be reported. So if you uh, come across uh, any kind of uh, situation where you feel this is not what it looks like, then in the first instance, you must make a written report, a, sus a suspicion report, and send that to the money laundering reporting officer. Now, you'll all have your own way of doing that back in your own respective firms. You'll probably have a, a, a template that you need to, uh, to use. <clears throat> when at the point of doing that, submitting your report in writing to the MLRO, you have to cease any action with the client until you're told any differently by them. What the money laundering officer then do, does is they have a look at the case and they do an investigation. And they'll decide whether or not they need to report this up to the National Crime Agency. Sometimes they will, sometimes they won't. If there's any element of doubt, they will normally do that unless they can do enhanced checks and satisfy themselves that that's not the case, yeah? What the National Crime Agency would then do is to uh, investigate themselves, then pass it on to the police, serious fraud offices, uh, HMRC, any other agencies they, they deem to be relevant, yeah? <clears throat> At the point of passing the, uh, the case through to the NCA, the money laundering officer will normally ask for permission at that stage for their consent to actually continue to deal with the client. The reason for that is we don't want to alert this client that they're under suspicion. Remember, that would be akin to kind of tipping them off, which is a big no-no as regards the regulations. So behind the scenes, the investigations are happening and the NCA will typically uh, give permission for the transaction to be continued with, because if it does turn out to be dodgy, that's yet more evidence that, um, that all was not as it should have been. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, the investigation will uh, will take its course, and then ultimately, if it's uh, if it's the right thing to do, then uh, it will end up in court, either civil or criminal proceedings and uh, you will be subject as the uh, MLRO to a court order. Uh, the good news is that uh, where it goes to court, uh, if any uh, prosecution ensues, the suspicion report will not name any individuals. So the criminal will never understand who actually uh, reported their suspicions to the authorities in the first place. So it's a good level of protection only there when it comes to reporting. <clears throat> We've talked a lot about individuals, just need to, uh, to broaden that out a little bit now uh, to those of you who work uh, more in the corporate market. So you don't need to do any further identification checks where you've got a company or a subsidiary of a company that's actually quoted on the London Stock Exchange or recognised by the Financial Services Authority. Yeah. In terms of uh, a private company, could be a partnership or a small limited company, you don't have to do any further identification checks where one or, one or more of the directors or the partners is already known to the advisor. So the advisor knows they're a legitimate business, they're trading in their area, they've been there for donkey's years, they know them. In order to get on a listing on the stock exchange, believe me, you go through a significant amount of due diligence. So that's why there's no further identification checks necessary in those two instances. <clears throat> if um, you, you want to do business with a, a 
private company or a partnership where they're not known to you, then you just need to do enhanced level of, of due diligence in the corporate space. So you can do things like credit reference searches, get bank references, you definitely need to identify one or more of the directors or partners, usual stuff, date of birth, national insurance number, get their home address. And you really need to satisfy yourself who are the controlling shareholders in the business uh, and who has the influence within the business. Remember, this is all about money laundering. And one of the ways a criminal can get funds, can place funds into the system, is to take an interest in a business and start to channel funds through that. So who's really in control? Is it a front person uh, or is it? does it look like a typical and more normal trading structure? <clears throat> For those of you who work with uh, institutional clients, um, then uh, it's relatively straightforward to uh, do enhanced due diligence because they should be in their uh, industry directory. Um, and there are indeed, uh, if you need them, specialist consultant to actually work in this space that can, that can reference them for you, uh, whether it's around kind of charities or pension schemes. So there is, there is recourse to do uh, enhanced due diligence at a corporate level if you need to. But the vast majority of the time, I suggest dealing either with a, with a PLC or a company within your patch uh, and they're known to you, that won't be required. <clears throat> OK, so what we've done thus far is we've looked at uh, money laundering and all the anti-money laundering steps that we can take in the advisory space to try and mitigate that. I said as part of our learning objectives up front, we'd also take a quick look at financial crime because all these things kind of are entwined and interlock. In terms of financial crime, there is some, uh, some key legislation that help you identify and avoid the issues of financial crime. <clears throat> don't worry, you don't need to memorize what these are. I'm just giving you a little bit of, a, of a, an audit trail, really, of, uh, of where we are today, where these different acts have come from. So the CJA uh, in 93, that brought to the table the offence of insider dealing, and that's where the uh, tipping off offence originally kind of uh, originated from. Then you've got the, uh, the one I think we all know about, POCA 2002. That was the first real attempt to criminalise all forms of money laundering. And that it broadened out from just tipping off to reporting suspicions and, uh, and all that good stuff, really. Then there was a fraud act that came out four years after that. Uh, and that just said that, you know, as, a, as somebody in business, you have to be cognizant of and have processes and systems in place to make sure that you're not defrauded. You might be thinking, well, what's he talking about fraud for here? Well, I'm talking about it because uh, fraud, uh, money laundering is a way of defrauding uh, individuals and businesses because the source of funds are not legitimate. So you are uh, lying or, or obfuscating against where these funds have actually come from because you've, you've not disclosed information. <clears throat> Similarly, you know, it, the Bribery Act, it's got general offences around um, bribing others. So again, think about what we're doing here, money laundering. If you do this for me, uh, you can enjoy some of the share of the, uh, of the proceeds. So again, going back to, uh, to my uh, Ozark example, my money launderer over there in the States, he takes 10% uh, of everything he's able to, to launder uh, by way of a bribe. <clears throat> As I said, when we talk about money laundering these days, it, within the same breath, we also need to consider uh, financing of terrorism and the first uh, attempt to uh, to deal with this this issue was the counter-terrorism act in 2015 and 
it's the FCA's duty to actually enforce that act, which it does through its rule book in the normal way. And then the final one really would be around the uh, Data Protection Act uh, and good old GDPR, which I know will be subject to, uh, to another workshop uh, in the coming weeks. <clears throat> Again, I think this is very well ingrained into our, our processes now. Uh, it's about taking uh, responsibility for data but again, there's an obvious link there between that and money laundering and making sure people who are who they say they are uh, and the data is being handled securely. In terms of financial crime, FISMA, good old FISMA, uh, defines financial crime as any offence involving fraud or dishonesty, misconduct or misuse of information, relating to financial markets, handling the proceeds of crime. Uh, and of course, there's, within that, there are risks for firms. So, you know, you could, and I'm saying this would be very, very rare, but it does happen from time to time that firms are defrauded uh, and embezzlement goes on. Uh, it could be that you are defrauded by your clients because they've given you false details or criminals, more likely, who are trying to get their money. But <clears throat> you're subject to, uh, to FISMA because they're trying to use your firm to launder the proceeds of crime. Or they're trying to use your firm to make payments to crime bosses or to terrorists. You're at risk if data is stolen and, and then used, which may aid in the met money laundering, and there's also uh, you're at risk from identity fraud. Think about what money laundering is. It's about trying to conceal the identity, not only of the source of funds, but the individuals who are perpetuating the crime. <clears throat> so talking specifically to terrorist financing, just for a second, this is about providing funds for any terrorist activities, which typically have to be laundered before the funds can be provided. Therefore, you have to have anti-money laundering processes in place. So two main sources of terrorist financing. One, it could be support from countries, organizations, or individuals. So yeah, that's just what it says on the tin. Some people want to sponsor um, terrorism because it suits their own uh, political or uh, individual aims. And it could also be as a result of revenue generating activities. So, you know, and that could be anything that you can think of, really. Or some examples there could be drugs, could be human trafficking, um, could actually be fraud. You know, there's a growing uh, risk of, uh, of fraud with uh, the increase in uh, IT usage within financial services on a global kind of scale. So it's important to remain diligent always when you're thinking about money laundering and, and uh, financial crime, just to make sure that funds are coming from legitimate sources and not coming from anywhere that you would, or anybody else looking at it uh, objectively, would have any concerns about. <clears throat> if you ever have any kind of uh, concerns or, or worries about somebody trying to do business with you and you think that uh, the potential source of this is from terrorism or uh, revenue generating activities, then you can get a list of possible terror suspects from HM Treasury. <clears throat> In terms of financial sanctions, when you're talking about financial crime, um, it's best not to, uh, to get involved with them if you can help it, because the financial sanctions imposed by the government can be quite swinging. Um, financial sanctions can be imposed by, uh, by the government on individuals, entities, other governments who may be in the UK or may indeed be, be abroad. So you've been hearing about this quite a lot in the last few weeks when they've been talking about the, uh, the build-up of uh, troops on the Ukrainian border from, uh, from Russia. And there's been lots of talk about the UK government imposing financial sanctions, 
financial sanctions both on the Russian government and also some individuals, the so-called oligarchs, who, uh, who would have assets here in the, uh, in the UK. So these financial sanctions are very real. A key element of financial sanctions is asset freezing. So that does what it says on the tin there. I don't care if you've got a few million quid in that account, that's it. There's no way you can actually get uh, to use them. So <clears throat> two elements to asset freezing. It's basically saying that you can't deal with any of the funds or resources that are owned or held by a designated person. So there they go. You can see them, you can, but you can't use them. Or you can't uh, make funds available to or economic resources available to somebody who is a designated person. So I'm a Russian oligarch. I've got 10 billion quid in the UK sitting in a current account. Yeah, UK government freezes it. He brings his mate up and says, OK, uh, could, you, uh, could you send me some funds? Because I'm a bit short. My money's been frozen. What these sanctions say is, no, you can't. You can't make transfer of funds to that designated person because they're subject to an asset freeze. <clears throat> so it's, it, you know, it's not just uh, transferring money or moving money, it's about even trying to transfer the ownership of the money. So again, going back to my example, I can't get, I'm just gonna transfer them into, into your name instead or into a spouse's name or relation's name. No, 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 that isn't, that isn't allowed. So how do financial sanctions apply to, apply to you? So the Treasury is responsible for implementing sanctions and actually comes from the Office of Financial Sanctions Implementation. <clears throat> you probably didn't realize we even got one of those, yeah? And <clears throat> if you're interested, you could go on to the HM Treasury website and you can actually find, if you do a search on that, the financial sanctions list. And actually, as a list of all individuals and entities who are subject to penalties in the UK. So if you've got a spare 10 minutes this afternoon and they're at a loose end, why don't you go on and, uh, and have a look at that financial sanctions list? Makes uh, interesting reading. <clears throat> so financial sanctions orders, as I said, prohibit a firm from carrying out transactions with a person or organisation. They're known as the target also means that you cannot provide them with any form of financial services. Yeah. If the, the authorities uh, deign it uh, okay, they may permit a license to enable you to continue with the transaction. So it may be that if somebody doesn't get some of those uh, funds, there will be, uh, they will be in difficulties. So if an appeal is made, they may under license let you continue with a transaction. <clears throat> and this is, uh, this is the biggie, that uh, you have to comply absolutely with the sanctions regime. So if, if you choose to do business with anybody who's on the financial sanctions list, that would be a criminal offence. Not only is it subject to a uh, seven year prison sentence, but you could also be fined up to a maximum of a million quid. So pretty swinging penalties from a financial crime perspective if financial sanctions have been applied. Okay, so uh, we're starting to, uh, to come to the end of the, uh, the training course now. What I wanted to do at this point is just to go back to the learning objectives that we framed right at the start of the session. So what we said we would do as a result of uh, being here this morning is we'd understand money laundering and the other relevant regulations. Yeah, so we don't need to um, be able to um, repeat what the different acts are. We just need to know how to apply them and what they mean to us. For instance, you know, we need to do customer due diligence. So we now need now we now know or have been refreshed on the need to conduct due diligence of what that actually looks like from a from a diligence perspective we latterly looked at how to identify and report suspicious activity and we looked at that category of individuals who are classified as potentially exposed people 
And we said for them, always, there'll be an enhanced level of customer due diligence required. Towards the very end of the session, we just had a very brief look at what is meant by terrorist financing, because as you've seen from the different acts, money laundering and terrorism financing now are normally incorporated into single acts of parliament. And then for the last five minutes, we've just been looking at financial crime, the offences and how to mitigate the risks of, uh, of financial crime being perpetrated in your firm. OK, so <clears throat> I've said a number of times now that uh, a number of you on the call will be uh, no doubt keen to get on and to take the relevant test. So I thought I would just uh, refresh your memory in terms of how to find these tests. So if you go on to the BAT system in the normal way, uh, and then you'll see down the, uh, the left hand side of the screen there, there's a section marked T and C. So if you were to click that, which is what this screen is showing you, there is a uh, section in that uh, on that screen labeled financial exams. Uh, I believe uh, AML is about the second one down. Uh, I did all the tests. Uh, you had three attempts at the test. I did the tests yesterday. Um, I'm very confident that you have all the information that, uh, that you would need to be successful in that test. As a why don't you, even if you don't have to do the test because of your role, why don't you? Yeah, we've still got uh, 10 minutes left of the, uh, the time you scheduled out in your diary. Um, there are only 20 questions in the test, you would easily rattle that off in, uh, in 10 minutes or so. So as a suggestion, why don't you, once this, uh, this session's over, jump on and get that, get that done and dusted and out of the way. <clears throat> And then finally, for those of you who would, uh, would like a uh, CPD certificate to log your attendance on this so that you can uh, keep that file up to date, um, very happy to, uh, to provide you with, with that. If you'd like either to take a photograph of that, uh, that screen or, uh, or quickly scribble that down, it's a very easy email address to, uh, to remember. <coughs> After the session, uh, once the, uh, the magic of Zoom does its uh, works, its magic, um, I'll be emailing a copy of today's training session uh, in full over to, uh, to IFAC. And I know they're very keen to, uh, to post that up as an additional resource, uh, refresher and reminder. If there's anybody else in your firm who you think might benefit from the information that we've covered today. So, Thank you very much for your attention. If there's any questions, I'm very happy to take them now. Thank you, Jeremy. It was informative as always. Well, thank you very much. Nice to see some familiar faces from last year, I've got to, uh, to say. Uh, thank you very much again for your kind attention and uh, see, you, uh, see you next week or whenever. Great. Thanks. Thank you, Jeremy. Yes, bye-bye. Yeah. Yes.